Hey, good afternoon, good morning, or good evening, depending upon where you are in the world. Welcome to today's DevOps.com webinar. I'm Charlene O'Hanlon, moderator for today's event, and I welcome you. As always, we have a great webinar on tap, but before we get started, we do have a few housekeeping items we need to go over. First of all, today's event is being recorded, so if you miss any or all of the event, you will have the opportunity to access it later on. Following today's webinar, we will be sending out an email that contains a link to access the webinar on demand. And we are taking questions from the audience. So if at any time during today's presentation, you have a question for either of our speakers, please don't wait, don't hesitate. Just use your GoToWebinar control panel and submit your questions. And we will try to get to as many as we can near the end of today's webinar. Also, at the end of today's webinar, we are doing a drawing for two $50 Amazon gift cards. So please stick around. Hopefully, you'll be one of our two lucky winners. All right, with that, we'll go ahead and kick off today's webinar, which is Simplifying Security for OpenShift and Ansible Environments. Our speakers today are Joe Garcia, who is a CISSP and DevOps, engineer, DevOps security engineer at CyberArk. Hi, Joe, how are you? Great, thank you. Good, good, good. And we also have Dave Muir, who is the Global Security Partner Solution Architect at Red Hat. Dave, thanks for joining me. How are you? Doing awesome. Thanks, Charlene. All right. All right, great. Well, Dave, I know you're going to be kicking off the conversation, so I'm going to put myself on mute, kick myself off camera, and let you get right to it. We'll see you in the Q&A. All right, thank you. Yeah, so welcome, everyone. And um, just a little bit more introduction about myself. As Charlene mentioned, I'm the Global Partner Solution Architect at Red Hat. I focus on um, our security ISVs, so folks like CyberArk. And um, you can see some of my uh, social media here. And actually, J Joe uh, created this slide for me, and I appreciate you, Joe, uh, pointing out the fact that I do mostly post pictures of my homemade pizza. I'm an amateur. But uh, the, the other interesting fact is I like pizza so much and open source that I have created the first ever open source pizza license. So if you go out to my GitHub account, you'll be able to see it. You can see all the conditions and obligations. I'm trying to get it to go viral. But, uh, but anyway, I'll turn it over uh, now to Joe, who by coincidence is one of my Tampa Bay neighbors. Joe? Thanks, Dave. This is... This is actually news that you have a pizza license out there. I, I, I know what I'm doing after we get off of this now. That's, that's totally awesome. Yeah. Uh, my name is Joe Garcia. I'm a DevOps security engineer uh, and, and for CyberArk, uh, but you know, just really love automation of all kinds. So you'll, you'll probably run into me if you ever deal with CyberArk and anything automated, uh, anything dealing with APIs, whether it's ours or, or integrating with a third party. Um, I've been doing this for a long time, even as a customer of CyberArk before I came on board. So hopefully we can show you some really easy ways of integrating CyberArk security and utilizing the automation that Red Hat provides through its different products. I can be found on Twitter, LinkedIn and my favorite GitHub. I don't have a pizza license, but I do have open source out there, open source projects uh, that that work with all sorts of different secrets backends that you can go and explore. <clears throat> so before we start to dive into OpenShift and Ansible and how to secure them, what they are, things like that, we really need to talk about the problem that we're facing today. And, and the problem is really simple. I mean, at the end of the day, we're all human. OK, we get stressed out very easily. And I don't know about you, but when I get stressed out, I can't focus on a particular task very well or as well as I'd like to because of everything else running through my mind. I'm an anxious guy. You know, uh, we, we get busy. I, I get busy a lot. And it's really hard for me to be able to uh, make sure that I'm not missing any sort of configurations, maybe missing that a secret happens to be. Uh, in my source code that I needed to pull out after I was done locally developing. Things like this can happen when we're too busy, we're stressed, or you know, we used to get time off, right? And when we had that time off, who would be doing our job for the week we're out? Sometimes we have backups, but you know, not all the time are they as strong as we are as the primary person in our job's role. And now today, we're dealing with a new normal, as they say, with the pandemic where I've got a dog outside, so if you hear any barking, you know, uh, I apologize, but 
there's a lot of other distractions on top of the work that we need to do. We may have young childs that need additional attention and no daycare to take them to. Kids are home from school doing virtual schooling but can't focus because the teacher's not there keeping them focused. So now the parents and you, the workers, need to start focusing on their education as well. So a lot of things are really causing us problems as humans, which, re which we start to rely on automation for. But our human nature is easy for us to easily just deal with the human credentials, right? Those local administrator accounts that are out there, the users' privileged accounts, their ADM accounts, all of this. And we really start to forget that because of everything I just explained as a problem, we're relying on automation a lot more uh, to start to fill those gaps where we need more time to do life-related things. And if we take a look at this iceberg, icebergs are a lot bigger than you would think. Actually, about 90% of them exist underneath the ocean and are completely out of sight. And this is typically how we treat non-humans. So today we're gonna to talk about OpenShift and Ansible, both automated uh, platforms, one dealing with con uh, containerization, the other dealing with operations-based tasks. And we're going to look at securing those and we're gonna dig underneath the ocean and deal with those non-humans today. Yeah, so I guess that's a cue for me, uh, Joe. The, and I wanted to add to the, um, Oops, I went a little bit too far. What Joe was saying with a quick uh, ant antidote here. Um, so I was I was chatting with one of our uh, Red Hat field solution architects, and uh, this was a couple of weeks ago. And I, you know, I mentioned this webinar with CyberArk, and his, his eyes lit up because he was basically saying he had some customers who who had CyberArk, who had Ansible, and OpenShift, uh, and was describing their setups, which I pretty up for this webinar here. Um, and it shows, you know, the key challenges that they had, which was they all, uh, well, they had different cloud environments. You know, they had some OpenShift uh, deployments in private clouds, on-prem. They had some other flavors of Kube in, in public clouds. Um, and they had different teams across their business units, all trying to create new projects. So the question was, well, how do they automate that? How do they automate the Kubernetes project creation? and provision identity access, you know, when a team needed to start a new project. So that um, is absolutely what uh, we're gonna be talking about today and can be solved by the tools we're talking about. And I just thought it was such a cool example, you know, real world example that uh, that's so that fits so well into this webinar. Um, because, you know, as, if anybody goes into a hybrid cloud environment, you're gonna face this challenge. Now, I mentioned hybrid cloud, and of course, that, that term is mentioned a lot. Uh, so I wanted to take a minute to give you Red Hat's perspective um, on, on that term. So open hybrid cloud is a Red Hat strategy. It's our strategy uh, really for how our products, our portfolio, um, help our customers uh, move into the future, move their IT architectures into the future. It all starts with open source. Um, we've been delivering this uh, to our customers for about 10 years now, uh, giving them you know, flexibility and control and choice, most importantly, when building their applications and their IT infrastructure. So if you think about it for today, if you exam, I mean, today as an example, if you build an app and run it in your own data center, um, this strategy would give you the choice, it gives you the freedom to run that same app in a private or public cloud in the future. And there's a couple of advantages. You know, you don't have to rebuild apps. You don't have to retrain people, uh, maintain different environments. And of course, you don't have to sacrifice security. And so to, so to uh, support you know, Red Hat's open hybrid cloud strategy, we've organized ourselves into uh, three pillars that you see here. There's hybrid cloud infrastructure. This is all about uh, standardizing your IT infrastructure, having it being able to consistently be deployed across all IT footprints. Um, this pillar contains OpenShift, which we'll talk about today. You've got management and automation there at the bottom. This is all about simplifying and automating the ways our customers are configure, deploy, and secure software. Um, this is where we see Ansible's automation platform. And then you see cloud native development, which is um, you know, about providing the right tools 
uh, to support DevOps and, and cloud native development. OpenShift is in here as well, uh, but another product example is, is Code Ready Workspaces. Now, of course, at the core is Linux. So uh, this helps us really to maintain the, the consistent user experience across our entire portfolio. You know, for example, if you think about containers, um, and RHEL can either be a container by itself, a base image, or through a universal base image as well. So whatever, however you consume RHEL, you know, that'll be the base. Um, the plan for us, you know, to deliver on this strategy I talked about, this open hybrid cloud vision, is really us maintaining this portfolio and how they all work together. And so here's, here's what it looks like. You can see the blue rectangle on the left. That's the management and automation pillar. The green rectangle on the top is all the cloud development pillar. And then the red rectangle at the bottom is uh, hybrid cloud infrastructure. So let's dive into OpenShift a little bit. Um, the key thing to note that I always point out in this slide is that gray bar there. Who, uh, OpenShift is Kubernetes plus a bunch of all the other services that come out of the box that you see here. Um, now, I look at this slide, you know, a lot of times I say, well, if I had to implement you know, the community version of Kubernetes in an enterprise, now I, I would need to add all these things anyway. So for example, I'm gonna need an operating system. I'll need monitoring, I'll need networking, um, a container registry. I'll definitely need some developer tooling. Uh, and if I have multiple clusters, which all enterprises do, I'll need an interface to manage those clusters. And so this is the value of OpenShift. Now, OpenShift is a secure by design platform because all the added services we just talked about have been designed with security in mind. The results of that are a bunch of security features that you can see there on the left-hand side. We'll talk about some of those on the upcoming slides. And then there's some kernel-based foundational uh, <clears throat> features that you see in the red pillars there with Red Hat Enterprise Linux and CoreOS. And, and those features, those foundational features help you to secure containers you know, at the boundaries and also help you uh, protect the host from container escapes. Um, those four red pillars on the right there are SE Linux. This, that's a labeling system which provides mandatory access controls on every process and every operating system object. Then you've got namespaces, uh, which can provide multi-tenancy. There's a uh, SecComp or secure computing mode. This restricts the set of system calls apps can make. And then uh, control groups. Control groups allow you to manage things like CPU, memory, uh, network usage for your processes. And so one of those foundational pillars is Projects. Um, projects are Kubernetes namespaces. Uh, that's what we call them in OpenShift. We call them projects, but they're, they're namespaces plus some metadata. Um, and they're fundamental for isolation within a cluster because you can isolate you know, services across your teams, your groups, departments. And this, this all provides you with a level of multi-tenancy that you just can't get uh, with the community version of Kubernetes, uh, which is basically, you know, you're ensuring that the right users are accessing the right projects and services. Now, now cluster and project access starts with uh, identity and access management. So obviously this is authentication. This is yet another one of those added services that OpenShift provides on top of the community version of Kubernetes. It comes uh, with a built-in OAuth server by default. And, and you can see the three-step process it uses for authentication using tokens and identity providers. Uh, the screenshot on the right shows you uh, some example identity providers you can use in OpenShift, like GitLab, GitHub, LDAP. Uh, but once you have these identities, you'll need to control what they can access. And this is all through authorization, which is handled by role-based access control, or RBAC. So RBAC determines whether a user is allowed to perform a given action. Pretty simple. It's like you know allowing a user to create a pod in a project. It's made up of rules, which um, are the actions or verbs permitted on that object. Then you've got roles, the, it's the collection of those rules, and of course, bindings. So how those roles are mapped to users and groups 
and all the relationships between those objects you can see are illustrated on this slide. Now, I did want to make an interesting note on this. So RBAC has been part of OpenShift uh, from the beginning, from OpenShift 3.0. And while you know that feature hasn't been in community Kubernetes for some time, over the past couple of years, uh, Kube has caught up. And it's primarily due to the fact that Red Hat contributed this code back to upstream, uh, to the upstream Kube project. There is still one big difference. So RBAC is enabled by default in OpenShift. In, in Kubernetes, you have to enable it with the authorization mode flag when you start the API server. But I just wanted to point that out. It's, it's again, an example why OpenShift has been designed uh, with security in mind. But I don't wanna uh, sound like I'm bashing on Kube because OpenShift is Kubernetes. And just to provide another example of this is secrets management. Um, some of you would, would know that you can rebrand this uh, with the Kubernetes logo. And, and because in both deployments, you know, by default, secrets are encrypted while in transit with TLS. And you have the option of encrypting them at rest in etcd as well. And so there's no difference how secrets management is handled in OpenShift or Kubernetes. I do want to note the last bullet, though, about the best practice to integrate with uh, an external system like uh, a secrets fault. And of course, that's why Joe and I are doing this webinar really to showcase CyberArk <laughs> secrets management capability that extends and enhances Red Hat's features in these cases. Definitely. Thanks, Dave. Yeah. So that's what we're going to focus on right now is how CyberArk can be utilized as that external uh, secrets management solution to provide secrets uh, back into an application being hosted in OpenShift. Um, <clears throat> why would you want to do this? Well. Let's think about it. We don't want to create security islands by utilizing all of the different credential managers and all of our tools in our pipeline when we can centralize all of that, centralize the audit, create management, and then provide those secrets just in time. This allows us to make changes to those secrets up without breaking any processes in our pipeline and our automation keeps going. So we created an integration uh, that works with both Kubernetes, but we're going to focus more on Red Hat OpenShift uh, today and how it interacts with that. We had a couple ideas in mind when we started to approach this integration uh, and planning it out. We knew that we wanted to supply secrets in a secure manner to an application running in a pod in OpenShift or Kubernetes. That's that's easy. That was the, the main goal, right? Um, but we wanted it to integrate seamlessly into the platforms themselves and use the platform to provide strong authentication without having to utilize any sort of secret zero or a token being passed around in and out of the cluster. We didn't want to use any of that. We also wanted to be able to provide a segregation of duties uh, throughout between our app devs and operations teams and, and between different projects as well, as uh, Dave mentioned a couple slides ago, using that, the, the projects uh, that you, or namespaces in Kubernetes in order to create that segregation of duties. But at the end of the day, what we really wanted to introduce to OpenShift was the ability to centralize all of the audit of secrets being accessed and what they were being accessed by as well as secret rotation and being able to introduce that in without breaking any of the applications that are relying on these secrets in order to make backend connections or service connections. So we have a couple different options for secret delivery um, with this authenticator. And each option uses the same strong authentication I just talked about, uh, where we're utilizing the attributes of a pod in order to authenticate that it exists and that it is allowed by our security policy to access a secret. The ways that we give these secrets to the application vary. We can utilize our secret list broker, which you can uh, go out to conjure.org and read about today. Our secret list broker basically takes the secrets management piece or handling piece away from the developer altogether. So rather than giving uh, developer credentials that need to be secured in OpenShift or giving a developer uh, API access to a secrets management source to grab those credentials as they need them, the developer doesn't even have to worry about credentials. They could make an unauthenticated request to a Postgres 
uh, SQL database, for example, over 5432. And what our secret list broker will do is listen on that port for any sort of communication coming from the application. And when it does have communication going out, it will grab that communication, it will inject the secrets at that point and complete the connection to Postgres. This way, whether they put in dummy test for the username and password for connection or they didn't provide any authentication at all, it doesn't matter. We're going to authenticate the request on its way to the back end using our secret list broker. Very, very cool uh, solution that I, I definitely would love for everyone to take a look at at conjure.org. You, you can, just like as I said before, use the API. Just make a call out, rewrite your application to call out directly to our API and get the secret. But you know, what developer wants to change their code? If anything, I, I just like it to, to work kind of like Secretless does and not have to worry about secrets or changing code at all. So we do also have another solution called Summon, which is able to present the secrets as environment variables that only your application can access. All right, at no point are the secrets written to the local file system in a persistent state. They are held in memory, in a secure memory cache. Now, the problem with this uh, summon uh, setup is that it is an init only solution. You will need to restart the application in order to fetch new secrets, which is why we still recommend the secretless broker. And then finally, we do have the capability of pushing those secrets back to Kubernetes secrets. So maybe you're not ready right now for a complete move to a secret management service. That doesn't mean you can't still introduce rotation and centralize the audit. Difference being that we'll push it back to either OpenShift or Kubernetes secrets, and your application can continue working today the way that it does fetching the secrets from there, but you have the added knowledge that you have centralized audit of how those secrets are being used and rotation capabilities without breaking anything. We're updating the, the secret storage in Kubernetes and OpenShift uh, so that we won't break any of the processes that are going on in your applications. So let's kind of take a look at the secretless broker a little bit deeper. You know, today, uh, hopefully no one's doing this, but hey, it can happen in developing environments. You know, anything goes in those Wild West areas sometimes. You know, we, we, we hard coded credentials at one point whether that was in a manifest, a web config, or, or some other sort of file that then we're grabbing and, and placing them into environment variables for, it doesn't matter. They're still in plain text at one point in a file somewhere on our local file system. And we started moving towards, you know, vaulting credentials. And you guys have probably heard a lot about that. We vault the credentials. The developer then will handle the secrets in the application, whether that's calling out over an API or some sort of provider, credential provider or what have you, and then making the connection themselves with the secrets that they retrieved in their application to that target backend. It's a lot more secure than putting them in plain text, but at the end of the day, the secrets are still going into the application and being used there in some sort of uh, in some sort of manner. And then the final step is where our secretless broker architecture is today, where we're isolating the applications completely away from the secret themselves, and the application just thinks it's talking to Postgres SQL or whatever target DB we're talking to as the back end. But the difference is that secretless broker is there listening on the ports that the policy has been set up to listen on. And as long as communication comes across, those secrets can be injected into that, uh, into that connection request and then brokered by secretless to the target backend. Developers don't have to focus on anything but writing code. They don't need to handle secrets in a manifest. They don't need to interact with a vault of any kind. They're just focusing on what they do best and that is coding an application in an agile manner. So we're gonna walk through uh, kind of the, the flow of how this happens in OpenShift. You guys are probably wondering right now, well, I mean, that's great that we can deliver secrets in all these cool ways, but how are you doing it in OpenShift? So I'm going to show you here now an example using Summon, as you can see in the upper right-hand corner. We have an OpenShift cluster here outlined in red and two projects. We have our application project, we have our Conjure project, but first we need to talk about the different elements and explain them so that you guys understand if you've never worked with our products before. 
the main brains behind it all is the master of our dynamic access provider cluster. I'm gonna call it DAP going forward because dynamic access provider is kind of a tongue twister. <laughs> so if you hear me say DAP, uh, that is the enterprise version of our open source solution called Conjure, which you can check out at conjure.org. That master supports full read write functions. So anytime that we're uh, going to load a security policy or uh, you know, send audit data somewhere, it's all gonna go get sent down to the master. This is deployed, deployed outside of the OpenShift cluster, by the way. So that's why we have a Conjure project set up within the cluster for our followers. There are little worker bees. Uh, they can only read, on, do read only actions, and then they'll flow the audit data outside of the cluster to the master. So we have that centralized in the master. Uh, but at the end of the day, they're gonna be the ones who are going to interact with the Kubernetes API that underlies OpenShift and Kubernetes platform itself. The Conjure Authenticator client is a sidecar container. Uh, so your application would need to start up with a sidecar container uh, and it will take care of all of the uh, authentication that's going to occur between your application and the follower. And then finally, we have Summon. And Summon is a very, very, very lightweight binary that is run in the application's container in order to be able to provide it with that encapsulated environment full of variables that are your secret values. So I'm gonna animate everything for you and we're gonna make some magic here. We're gonna summon some secrets into an app container, uh, bringing them in from Conjure, and we're gonna do all the wizardry that needs to be done in the process. So first we need to create a security policy and then load it into the Conjure master. Because if we don't create a security policy, then how will we ever be able to auth make, make an authorization of an identity that is trying to get access to our secrets? Uh, so here's an example policy. It is based in YAML, so it's easily human readable, machine readable, uh, everybody's happy-go-lucky. In this instance, we have a service account that's tied to our application project, and that is going to get granted to all of that particular application secrets. And we're gonna load that into the Conjure master, as I said, that, that DAP master. It is the read-write where we load policies, et cetera. Now, when the pod starts up and your application container spins up, the sidecar will immediately start, which holds that Conjure Authenticator client, that Conjure Authen client. And when it starts up for the first time, it's going to create a certificate signing request. This certificate signing request is going to hold all of the details of the particular application and the pod that we're dealing with. And that will then get sent to the follower with all the pod details in that CSR. And the follower will then utilize the Kubernetes API that underlies OpenShift and Kubernetes in order to verify that that pod actually exists. So we've got the pod's details in our follower. Now we need to make sure that it's a legit request for a certificate signing. So we'll check the API and see, hey, does this tag match this pod? Does this IP address fall in this pod? Does X fall in here? And these are all attributes that were written and loaded in the security policy in steps one and two. So we'll be able to verify what was loaded by you in our policy with what we're getting from the Kubernetes API and then also verifying that it actually exists. So there's three different pieces happening there. So if it does exist and we're like, okay, everything checks out, we look good to go, we'll go ahead and sign that request and write it out of band back to the Conjure Authent client completely out of band here. And once that gets it, it'll make a final call to the follower with that signed certificate. And then it'll start its authorization on the security policies to see what it has access to. And once it does a check of that, a token's generated and sent back to the Conjure Authentic, Conjure Authentic client in the sidecar, and that's placed into shared memory. So, the token is now in our shared storage between our app container and our sidecar container, and Summon will then use this token for its authentication back to the follower to retrieve the secrets it needs to provide as an environment variable. And I'm sure it'll animate out here, and then we get cool keys over through Summon to the app container. Okay. 
just to give you guys a second, I'm gonna set here so you can take in all of the nine steps that I just explained. Yeah, it's good stuff. And if anybody has any questions, you know, feel free to submit them in the question section. I'll uh, I'll interrupt Joe. Got to yeah. make him make him sweat a little bit here. So <laughs> all, all I love stuff. it. I'm already in Florida. You don't need to make me sweat anymore, That's man. Right. That's <laughs> good point. Uh, so so then let's take a look at at the Kubernetes secrets uh, method or the OpenShift secrets method of injecting it there. The real on, only difference from from the summon method is the fact that from the init container that gets started up, uh, we're going to be providing those secrets down into Kubernetes or OpenShift secrets rather than to some sort of component or shared volume that is connected with the application container itself. Um, let me see. So we still have our master, still have our follower, but the secret provider for Kubernetes is what's utilized instead of our authenticator client. And then that will communicate with Kubernetes or OpenShift secrets just go back for a second. So the whole process will always follow this slide here. This is going to be the main way that we present identity to a pod within OpenShift, whether it is Summon that's delivering the secrets or you're fetching them using the API, you still have access to that token there. Or if you're utilizing Secretless Broker, the end of the day, this is all going to need to take place in some capacity for that identity to be established. So it's attribute-based authentication. Now, auto-scaling. We all are using OpenShift or Kubernetes because we love the auto-scaling uh, uh, benefits that it provides. And so we definitely utilize that uh, to the fullest amount that we can. So let's say you need to create an additional follower because you're starting to scale out, it's Black Friday, you know what's coming, and so we're going to start increasing capacity in preparation for this, but this means you need to create an additional follower from us. So we've automated that process for you, just to walk you through it real quick and, and show you. You know, when a follower, pod would, uh, a follower pod starts up in our Conjure project during that auto scale process, an init container is initialized and that creates the certificate signing request. And that CSR goes to the master with the pod details and everything. And that is goes through the verification check to make sure it actually exists, that pod exists. And if it exists, it gets signed and written out of band. So the same process we're used to seeing from the previous slide. Now this is where it gets a little bit different because what we're going to do is instead of going to the follower to start to get a token for our identity, our authentication going forward, instead we're going back out to the master again with that signed certificate and having it send us what's called a seed file. And the seed file contains all of the configuration that a follower would need in order to deploy itself and join itself to our cluster, our, our DAP cluster or our Conjure cluster. So once that seed file uh, is, is given to the seed fetcher, it writes the seed file into the shared storage. It will then terminate itself. A new application container will pop up, which is the actual follower this time. And then that seed file is fetched from the shared storage and then unpacked. And when we unpack it, that's us configuring and joining the follower onto the cluster. So all of this is automated for auto scaling. Uh, and, and a real great uh, way of being able to keep your secret retrievals up to par with your application as it's also scaling out as well. Bing, bom, boom, done. So the benefits of this, I think, are, are pretty plain to see now. Uh, you know, simple, secure, seamless method of retrieving credentials. I mean, it could be as easy as the code not even changing in the application as we saw. Uh, it does utilize spiffy compliant resource identifiers, end-to-end um, -end encryption with TLS, uh, robust authentication. The follower is running inside OpenShift, so you don't necessarily need to expose that API to any external resources. Our master is never going to need to communicate with the API. So you can keep it all up and running within, and then we can start to utilize the benefits OpenShift provides our followers to deal with auto-scaling, high availability, and things like that. Um, 
the security of the, the segregation of duties obviously exists in OpenShift, as Dave said earlier, but it can be extended even further by utilizing Conjure and the security policy RBAC uh, that's provided through there. So you can start to segregate uh, your duties from not only the namespace level, but the secret level as well. And then at the end of the day, you get a full centralized audit trail for all of your compliance needs uh, to get those auditors off your back. So uh, if you do want to dive deeper into this with us, I know it's a lot of information that we just went through. Uh, we have a session coming up, securing Red Hat OpenShift containerized applications at enterprise scale. And it's gonna be brought to you again by CyberArk and Red Hat. It, this session will go even deeper into OpenShift specifically, and you'll see how CyberArk interacts with it, what, what all the different policies and, and roles that need to be configured and how it's uh, set up. It's gonna be a demo heavy technical session. Many demos, deep dive into the technology and, and all questions will be answered. Uh, it's going to expand on what I just went over in this webinar, uh, really going over some real world use cases. Uh, the guy from our side, Jody Hunt, who will be doing it is like the professor of DevOps. I love to call him. The guy is so smart um, and can do amazing things with OpenShift with security. Uh, and, you know, it'll also introduce practical steps to get started using our Conjure open source uh, solution in order to get you up and running without even having to deal with us or from a sales perspective or anything like that. Um, and I believe you can register today on devops.com, not if, if not right now, then, you know, a little bit later on in the day. It will be held on June 24th at 1 p.m. Eastern, uh, same time that we all got together here today, just on June 24th. So hopefully we'll see you there. Uh, and, and a lot of questions will get answered and you'll get a lot of insight too from both Red Hat and CyberArk. Yeah, thanks, Joe. It's going to be a great session, especially to, to dive a little bit deeper technically. Uh, I know BJ from our side, he's he has real world experience with, with the tools and with helping our customers as well. So definitely awesome. look out for that, uh, yeah, that webinar. But uh, with a couple minutes left of the slides, uh, I want to get to the demo real quick. I just wanted to cover uh, Red Hat Ansible automation platform. And so um, I think we all know the world is automating and uh, Whoever uh, succeeds in automation will win. I got to tell you though, uh, this lady is not winning, right? She's like <laughs> in fifth place, looks like. She's tailgating this Volvo and there's a completely wide open left lane. So I don't know, I got to talk to our marketing people. But uh, but obviously I digress. <laughs> one of the better, um, well, one of the other, I should say other, not better, um, quotes that I like is this one where it says automation happens you know, when one person meets a problem that they never want to solve again. And of course, um, this could be something as simple as like turning on and off your lights. So for example, recently I've been playing around with Alexa and created a routine to actually turn on my porch light when, uh, when you know, somebody comes to the front door and my Arlo camera has detected uh, some movement. And, and just because I'm a weird dad, I, I have Alexa also saying the words ding dong it sounds kind of robotic, but it's it's hilarious. My kids are getting a kick out of it. Um, but when you need more uh, IT enterprise type automation, uh, that's when you should look to Ansible. And something that has you know these three words, right? It's simple, yet powerful and agentless. I think simple and powerful are pretty self-explanatory, but I wanted to just point out the word agentless uh, because you know it always uh, warms my heart when yet another red hat uh, technology is designed with security in mind because an agentless automation engine definitely reduces attack surfaces. So uh, I'll take you back when I first built my Ansible playbook, which by the way, full disclosure, wasn't that long ago. Um, I was at a workshop and it basically was to configure firewalls. And, you know, I was an app dev kind of guy. So I thought, you know, this is nice for IT folks, but obviously, you know, my, not my cup of tea. But then I saw something like this and realized uh, it's just, there's a heck of a lot more you can do just than configuration. You know, so for example, one of the use cases I was really interested in back then was uh, to you know, provision a firmware CI CD infrastructures, as well as all the stuff you need in the DevOps pipeline, uh, you know, because some of you probably know, trying to configure Jenkins plugins for multiple projects is kind of a mess. 
And so here's a bunch of other tech as well um, that you can use with Ansible. You can see your Jenkins in the DevOps section. Um, if you check out the security column, of course, you'll see CyberArk. And we're gonna see some of that here in the demo. Um, this really represents you know, the community of partners that we're building around Ansible. Um, and so the, the, this slide, the, there's another great quote that I like to steal is, you know, automation in silos is still silos, right? Meaning um, you've got multiple teams, if they're all doing their same thing, it's not very great. So you need, in order for your organization to work together, you need an automation platform. And that's why Red Hat provides the Ansible automation platform. So you can see here, it includes Ansible en Engine and Ansible Tower. Um, you get some, you get access to certified collections through the automation hub uh, and some, you know, analytics as well. You see it supports all the use cases below. Um, like I said, not just configuration management, but things like provisioning, app deployment, continuous delivery, orchestration, of course, my favorite, you know, security automation. Yeah, I know that, um, you know, from CyberArk's perspective, uh, we fall in to, we can fall in under provisioning, right? If you're provisioning systems, you're creating secrets and you need to get those secrets as they're created into a secure solution. We have stuff for that. The security automation piece is really cool. I know that at Ansible Fest uh, in August last year, um, they introduced the Ansible uh, security automation platform, and we're actually one of the initial vendors that were introduced in there from a remediation perspective. Uh, so if you happen to run across any, uh, you know, secrets that aren't onboarded or anything like that, we can take care of that now using Ansible uh, security automation. So that's uh, that's really cool. Yeah, that's right. Yeah, we're really excited about security automation. As you mentioned, there's the remediation part. There's two other items it's focused on. One is called investigation en enrichment, basically, you know, um, giving you the ability to get all the logs you need mm -hmm. from all the different tools. Like if you think about a um, an intrusion detection system or a SIEM um, firewalls, so collecting all those logs and then threat hunting is another thing it's looking at. Like, for example, you can create uh, rules or policies dynamically for example, implementing a new rule in an IDS, you know, from your SIEM tool. So oh, that's we're cool. really excited about it. Cool. Um, yeah, so Ansible Tower, that's the key piece, I think, to scale automation within, a, within your org. It, it centralizes all your Ansible automations. It's got a nice UI and also RBAC. Uh, you get this push button deployment, centralized logging, uh, and of course, a RESTful API. And, uh, and so for the last uh, three slides, I just wanted to leave you all with some quotes, and then I'll end with how security you know, challenges are solved with Ansible. These quotes are from the SANS Institute. Uh, they attempted to understand you know, successful security operations. And the second and third biggest SOC challenge were lack of automation and lack of integration. So, you know, as you know, most security teams are overwhelmed with just a ton of security and events and tools that they kind of have to weed through manually. Um, and then if you take these two challenges and combine it with this quote from Forrester, it gets a little bit scary. Uh, so why not fight fire with fire and solve these challenges with automation, right? So to wrap it up, here are some thoughts on, on those challenges, how they're solved with Ansible. One of the key reasons is I wanna take you back to what Joe mentioned in the beginning, which is, you know, we're humans. Humans are humans. and we make mistakes. And so the simple answer is automation, right? This reduces those human mistakes. It'll provide speed, consistency, repeatability. You know, if you think about those operations teams, on average, they're interacting with like five to six different tools to do their job. And they're manually interacting with all these user interfaces, handling sensitive data. It's all stressful situations. Um, and that increases the rate of mistakes, just like Cho mentioned earlier. Uh, manual steps can also sort of deviate from processes. And so it's very hard to verify control. And so the goal is really to remove these manual steps. And through that automation, you'll provide you know, that consistency, uh, that repeatability. You'll be able to verify and audit. So that does it. 
from the slides i believe it's demo time joe it's my turn all right so let's take a moment of silence uh to pray to the demo gods that everything goes well i only broke it once today and had to fix it before so here we go <laughs> <laughs> um, so we're going to do, uh, I'm going to show you CyberArk's integration with Ansible Tower. Um, as of version 3.5.1 of Ansible Tower, uh, CyberArk has a couple secret lookups, which are a new introduction into Ansible Tower. So we're out of the box now. When you go and you deploy Ansible Tower, you upgrade to 3.5.1 or above, you will automatically get out of the box with Ansible Tower the, what you need in order to integrate with us from a credentials perspective, okay? So what I'm showing you here right now is just a GitHub repository that holds a couple playbooks we're gonna be calling today. And the reason I wanted to show you this is just to show you a couple to show you, look, man, there's no secrets in here whatsoever. Couple variables, but no secret variables or anything like that. Um, just so that you don't think that I'm trying to play smoke and mirrors on you or anything like that. Um, and then we have de deprovision. So basically what we're going to be doing today, we're going to be provisioning three different operating system EC2 instances and then terminating them after they're provisioned. But if you know AWS at all, you, you will realize that that requires some sort of authentication to AWS for us to be able to deploy these. And that will come in the form of an AWS access key. So I have taken the liberty, because I'm sure uh, we don't have time for me to do everything from scratch, taking the liberty of loading up a particular AWS access key into CyberArk. Um, this is our privileged access solution. So you can store different credentials and secrets and keys in safes, kind of like you would in a bank. Uh, and then those safes are protected within our hardened vault. Excuse my dog if you can hear that. Um, as you can see, everything checks out. We're, we're in a compliant state, so everything looks good. It was verified today. So we should be good to go from the AWS access key perspective. Um, we won't even need to use this anymore. Uh, we won't need to see it or anything like that. We're gonna fetch it programmatically. Um, but how do we do that? Well, the way that we do that is by creating what's called an application identity. We can't really treat an application like a user. That doesn't make sense. We'll never know what's actually using the account from an automated perspective. So we've created the idea of application IDs, app IDs. And these application identities hold some information uh, that are needed for authentication. So Ansible will need to know that our app ID is called Ansible. I know, I'm super creative. Uh, but Ansible will also need to know that I've configured client certificate authentication that needs to be utilized. So we will be sending across the client certificate uh, and key. And it's also going to verify that the certificate serial number that I give matches the one that I've loaded in for my application's identity. And on top of that, we've whitelisted a couple IP addresses that use Ansible Tower in my lab. Uh, so it'll need to come from one of these IP addresses referencing Ansible as our app ID, but then also providing the proper client certificate authentication. If all that checks out, we get access to our secrets and the safes that are applied to this application's ID. From there, we just create uh, an access control list and use this as if it's a user. Easy stuff. That is going to be using our application access manager. I've also stored a couple, uh, that, that same AWS access key is stored in Conjure, uh, CyberArk Conjure, also known as our dynamic access provider. And you can see I have one host there. That's how we deal with our application identity in this instance. In Conjure, it's called a host identity. Uh, so that host identity is configured to the Ansible tower. Um, and you can see that it is working with Ansible. There's a badge for the integration so I can easily figure out what's going on there. And from a secrets perspective, I've got two secrets in here that the host can read. So as long as we're authenticating properly as our Ansible Tower host, we should be good to go. Now, from Ansible Tower's perspective, let me go ahead and log in as the admin, and I'll show you how we can set up what's called secret lookups. This was introduced, as I said earlier, in 3.5.1. I'm running 3.6.2 today. I have upgraded since. You know, it's nice to keep things up to date. Um, but let me show you from a credentials perspective what we've got going on here. 
probably looks normal to you. A couple machine credentials. I've created a custom one for when I want to use our REST API to onboard an account. But then I have you know, my Amazon Web Services stuff here. But then there's some new credential types I haven't seen before from CyberArk, the AIM credential, uh, central credential provider lookup and the Conjure secret lookup. That's what we're gonna be taking a look at today. If I wanted to create one of these, I would just click the green X up here, uh, create a name for it, and then select the credential type, and you'll see that they are provided here as a credential type. One lookup, two lookup, and there's lookups for other things too. So if you happen to have Hashi, you could use Hashi, or if you're using uh, Key Vault, you can use that through Azure, things like that. Uh, but we're focusing on our products today because, you know, CyberArk, come on guys. <laughs> So let's go back and we're gonna take a look at these pre-configured lookups here, starting with the central credential provider. So when you come here and you start to create this credential type and you choose it, the type details get filled out down here. And you can see a majority of them are encrypted. Even me as an admin can't view these. The show is grayed out. If, if I try to show it, I'm actually clicking. Right now, I can't see it. So even the admin doesn't have the property or the, doesn't have the permissions to see an application ID or to lift a client key and certificate after it's been entered. You have to change it once you click the little revert back uh, replace button here. The only thing that you can see is where my web service lives for the central credential provider. So what Ansible Tower will be doing is creating a REST API GET request to the web service that lives at that AIM URL. And it will provide the application ID, the client key, or I'm sorry, the client certificate, and it will uh, provide uh, additional information that we'll look at when we set up the credential. But think of this as like a connection broker in a way. So all of our secrets when they need to get retrieved just in time for Ansible Tower is going to flow through here if I say to go look it up in our CCP, our central credential provider. Now, if we take a look from a Conjure perspective, this works with both our open source Conjure solution at conjure.org and with our dynamic access provider, which is the enterprise edition of that open source solution. And the type details that you get presented with here are the Conjure URL, an API key, which is associated with that host identity that you can see again here as the username, and then the public key certificate, so we know we're talking to the proper Conjure master or follower when we're trying to make this request for secrets. Both of these lookups, this one as well as the other one, does have the capability of testing, and you can provide a secret identifier. Um, so if I'm in the Conjure UI and I go to secrets, this ID is a secret identifier that I can copy if my mouse stays put in one place, um, like this. And then we can test it out by adding it here. Secret, we, we store different versions of secrets in, uh, in, in Conjure or DAP. I'm going to put nothing, so I just get the latest version of it. And you can see that the test passed. It's not going to present in plain text that secret value to me, but it will let me know that the test passed and it was able to fetch it. Otherwise, it would be red and broken if I do something like this. And just, that's something that doesn't exist. You'll see, oh, we failed to find it, 404. So you can easily test that everything is working right out of the box without having to create playbooks to test with. Now, after we get our secret lookups uh, or, you know, set up and configured, that's it. We're just gonna start creating credential types like we used to. So for example, you'll notice I have my Ansible AWS user here for CCP. And if we take a look at this, the only thing that I did differently here is rather than pasting in the secret key in plain text and then having Ansible uh, Tower credentials encrypted at rest for me. I clicked on this little magnifying glass here and I was given the ability to set an input source. And this is where our secret lookups come into play. I chose CCP, but could have also chose Conjure, which I did for obviously the Conjure guy down here, we won't take a look at. Once you select that, you can go next. And this is where, you, this is the, the object query, for example, that we're going to send across that uh, will let us pinpoint the credential we want to retrieve and get it back. I can provide a reason if I need to. Sometimes we require reasons depending on your enterprise's setup. But at the end of the day, we'll look in this particular safe and it will look up this object name and bring back uh, the, the specific access key uh, secret. 
as the value. So it can change and change and change all at once. It doesn't matter. We're going to be fetching it just in time and bringing it into the playbook. And we can test this to make sure it works. Luckily, it does, or else we'd have a big problem. And then all of my prayers have gone unanswered. So we're good to go there. Let's go ahead and kick off a, uh, a workflow here. Under templates, I have a couple templates set up, a couple deprovisioning uh, tasks singled out, a couple provisioning tasks singled out. But in the essence of time, since we have five minutes till the top of the hour, I'm going to go ahead and click the rocket launch button and provision and then immediately deprovision using something Ansible Tower has called a workflow. So I went ahead and launched them. And while we're waiting for this to happen, you might be asking yourself, well, I mean, this is great if I want to bring in all of the secrets into Ansible Tower itself, but then how would I segregate the duties there? Well, simply in the credentials section uh, that we were just in, there's a permissions tab and you can cre create the RBAC using uh, teams and organizations here within Ansible Tower and then extend that down to the actual credential. So we see here, we just started up an Ubuntu EC2 instance. So I should be able to refresh here and see that it started up. Yeah, look, Ubuntu, CentOS, we're, we're all pending. We're waiting on RHEL 8 to come up and then they're just gonna start automatically coming down. So that tells me that we were able to successfully grab the secret from the central credential provider, which is linked here. If we were to view the credential, it would take us to the credential type. And now as they start to deprovision, we should start to see them also terminate as, as they, they'll start shutting down. As long as these turn green, we're good to go. Um, but at the end of the day, this is how easy it is to start integrating CyberArk with Ansible Tower to be able to provide secrets just in time to your different playbooks. The playbooks are just referencing, you know, the machine credentials, uh, environment variable, or or what have you in a normal fashion. The playbooks don't change at all. It's it's all brought in through the credential store here. And with that, we have time for Q and A. Maybe no, three minutes, two minutes, no. Mm, minutes. Not really. We we no. I can make it maybe fit in one quick question. So just so folks can. Choose the best one. Um, it's on okay, you. Okay, so here we go. <laughs> Can OpenShift and Ansible be installed and operate in other different OSs instead of using Red Hat OS, or does OpenShift and Ansible require to be installed on Red Hat OS only? Yeah, I'm going to put my Red Hat on and say, why would you not want to install it on RHEL? <laughs> <laughs> right. But, uh, but I'll put my open source hat on and, and say, you know, OpenShift, Ansible, they're all open source projects that we contribute downstream. So for example, OpenShift has um, OKD, which it's OpenShift version. I'm sure you can Google OKD and install an Ubuntu or whatever you know Linux flavor you want. Uh, so I think it is technically possible. You obviously won't get the uh, benefits of having a Red Hat subscription like support and uh, security fixes. Yeah, and, and from an Ansible perspective, uh, Ansible uses Python, which is OS independent. So if you can install Python, you can pip install Ansible, and it's as easy as that to get started with the open source Ansible solution. If you're interested in Ansible Tower, however, uh, you will need to go to the Red Hat website. I don't believe you need to use a RHEL instance, but I, I think that CentOS is kind of the open source alternative to RHEL. Is that is that right, Dave? Yeah. Sure, I'm not allowed to say that out loud, but yeah, CentOS. Well, is... I said it out loud, not you. I'm allowed to, right? Oh yeah, you're right. You can hum it out loud. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So, mm -hmm. <laughs> all right, yeah. great. Well, unfortunately, we we only have two minutes to the top of the hour, so we are going to have to cut uh, the Q and A very short. I do want to thank everybody who did submit questions, and if we didn't get to it, please know that these fine folks will be getting a copy of all of the questions that come through. So. Uh, I'm sure somebody from their organization will be more than happy to follow up with you. Uh, real quick, before we close things out, I got a message that instead of two $50 Amazon gift cards, we're actually doing six $25 Amazon gift cards. So without further ado, let's go ahead and do those drawings real quick. Our winners today are Brian O. Congratulations, Brian. Uh, next winner is Candace P. Congratulations, Candace. Uh, next winner, Daniel S. Congratulations, Daniel. Our next winner is 
Juan C. Congratulations, Juan. Next winner, that's number five, is Todd S. And then our final winner for today is William P. Congratulations to everybody who did win. We will be following up with you offline via email to get your gift card over to you. So please check your email. I uh, also want to remind the audience that today's event has been recorded. So if you missed any or all of it, or if you just want to watch it again, you'll have the opportunity to do so. Uh, we will be sending out an email that contains a link to access the webinar on demand. The webinar is also going to be living on the devops.com website. So you can always go find it there. Just go to devops.com slash webinars, look in the on demand section, and it should be right there waiting for you. Uh, Joe and Dave, thank you so much for a great presentation, chock full of information. Love it. Thanks. Thanks again for your expertise. Really appreciate it. Thank, thank you, you guys for the invitation. Anytime. All right. Great. All right. Great. Also want to thank the audience for joining me today. This is Charlene O'Hanlon and I'm signing off. Have a great day, everybody. Please stay safe.